will be telling your story that truly is worthy to be told and heard across the oceans and seas. We are driven by balance views, fearless in the spirit of fairness and truth. Someone you can trust who is just when you ask is a must. Cause there is an inquirer, there is an inquirer in all of us. Good afternoon and welcome to Meet Inquirer Multimedia. This is the forum of the Philippine Daily Inquirer, Inquirer.net, Radio Inquirer, Inquirer Bandera, Inquirer Libre, Cebu Daily News, and the Inquirer social media and mobile apps. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, Viber, Line, Kakao, FireChat, WeChat, and Telegram at hashtag Sok Villegas meets Inquirer. There will be a delayed broadcast on Radio Inquirer, 9.90 a.m. at 7 tonight. This is the 14th edition of Meet Inquirer, and a very special one at that. It is not very often that we have one of the leading and beloved lights of the Catholic Church in the hot seat. And in these uncertain times, to have him here to discuss burning issues is quite a blessing. Thank you, Archbishop Sok. We will have a proper introduction and welcome in a moment. At this point, I would like to request our executive editor, Mr. Jose Maria Nolasco, for his welcome remarks. Thank you, Juliet, Arch Archbishop Villegas, fellow inquirer employee. Our two main topics today, extrajudicial killings, and the proposed revival of the death penalty, both stem from President Duterte's controversial war on drugs. In many countries, the war on drugs goes hand in hand with killings carried out by lawmen outside the judicial system and within the judicial system. It seems it doesn't really matter. The United Nations estimates that 1,000 executions of drug offenders are carried out every year around the world. In the Philippines, more than 7,000 drug offenders have lost their lives in the war on drugs since President Duterte formally assumed office in July last year. That's only about eight months. And human rights groups have raised concerns that should Congress reimpose the death penalty, the Duterte administration would be able to execute more people in the drug war. Last December, an SWS survey showed that four out of five Filipinos, 78% have voiced fears that they or someone they know could be the next victim of an extrajudicial killing. For our multimedia forum today, we have invited Archbishop Socrates B. Villegas, President of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines, to elaborate on the CBCP position on extrajudicial killings <coughs> and the death penalty. I hope that this forum will fuel a more vigorous nationwide debate on the two issues. But before I turn over the floor to the Archbishop, allow me to provide everyone and our readers a framework on the pros and cons of the two issues. The arguments are similar for either of the two issues because they involve justifying the killing of people. And the arguments revolve around four main themes. Number one is retribution, on which President Duterte has anchored his main argument for the re restoration of the death penalty. An eye for an eye. But opponents are asking, is the killing of a drug offender 
the fitting punishment for his crime. Number two is deterrence. The death penalty is often justified with the argument that by executing criminals convicted of heinous crimes, we will deter the commission of such crimes. Opponents, however, say the statistical evidence doesn't confirm that deterrence works. By the way, statistical evidence also doesn't confirm that deterrence doesn't work either. Number three is rehabilitation. Do we punish prisoners or rehabilitate them? Many countries in Europe prefer alternative sentences that guarantee both protection from those who have committed grave crimes and punishment for them over the death penalty. Number four is the legality of the death penalty. Is its revival in accordance with the constitutional provision prohibiting unusual and cruel punishment? Does the restoration of the death penalty violate our international commitments, like our ratification of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which prohibits the imposition of the death penalty on drug offenses? So there, John, please formally introduce our guest. Thank you very much. Um, Joy Nolasco, Executive Editor of the Philippine Daily Inquirer. Good afternoon, and also thank you to Juliet, the Chief of the uh, Central Desk. I'm John Neri, and uh, it is my happy task to serve as your moderator for the next uh, 60 or uh, so minutes. Um, before I introduce our guest of honor, just a word about our um, format. It's uh, straightforward. Uh, if our guest of honor so likes, he can start with a uh, short uh, opening statement. And then after that, we will field questions uh, from uh, the floor. The questions will be asked by representatives of the different um, inquirer platforms, um, PDI, uh, inquire.net, uh, Cebu Daily News, Inquire Bandera, Radio Inquirer, Inquirer Libre, and so on. Uh, we will also have time to ask questions raised by our uh, followers on the different uh, Inquirer social media accounts. Um, I think that's it. I think we're, we're, we're about ready. Uh, to get to know our guest of honor, we've prepared a short introductory video. Let's roll tape. To many, Archbishop Socrates Villegas is known as the protege of the late Manila Archbishop Jaime Cardinal Sin. From his role as private secretary for the outspoken cardinal in the EDSA years, he has emerged from the cardinal's shadows to become the Archbishop of Lingayen Dagupan and the leader of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines. Archbishop Sok has taken on many battles since first being elected CBCP president in 2013. He was a leading voice in opposing the reproductive bill pushed by the administration of President Noynoy Aquino, whose mother, the late President Corazon Aquino, had close ties to him and Cardinal Sin. Now, on his second term as CBCP president, Archbishop Sok is unrelenting in leading the church opposition to state policies and actions that are deemed inimical to human dignity and the values of the Catholic faith. He is the first high-ranking Catholic Church official to have spoken against the killings of drug suspects in President Duterte's war on drugs and the burial of the late dictator Ferdinand Marcos at the Libingan ng Mga Bayani. He was 25 years old when he was ordained priest by Cardinal Sin in 1985 and since then he served as his private secretary. He was also rector of the Edsha Shrine and vicar general of the Archdiocese of Manila in 2001. Then Pope John Paul II appointed him Auxiliary Bishop. He received Episcopal ordination from Cardinal Sin in the same year. In 2004, he was appointed Bishop of Balanga Bataan. Describing his relationship with Cardinal Sin as like a father and son, Father Sok fulfilled the role of confidant, spokesperson, advisor, and in the latter years of the Cardinal's illness, caregiver. Two months after the Cardinal's death, Villegas finally had a cathedral under his wing after he finished restoring the Balanga Church that was built in 1739 and was heavily damaged during the war. Further ascending the church hierarchy, Archbishop Sok was appointed by Pope Benedict as Archbishop of Lingayen Dagupan in 2009. 
Malki is a member of the Secular Franciscan Order, the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, and the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem. He has written and published six books of homilies and spiritual reflections. He was awarded the Catholic Authors Award and the 10 Outstanding Young Men of the Philippines in 2000. The youthful Archbishop was born on September 28, 1960 in Pateros as the youngest of three children of Norma Jacinta Buenaventura and Emiliano Villegas, now both deceased. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Archbishop Soc Villegas. Good afternoon, uh, Archbishop Soc, and welcome to the other side of the confessional. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Chan. Thank you. Would you like to start with an opening statement, or do we get uh, right to the questions? You can go right to the questions. All right. Um, our, first, uh, our first question is from the PDI Executive Editor, Joey Nolasco. Archbishop, what can you say about uh, Senator Manny Pacquiao's uh, position that the Bible, his interpretation of the Bible, justifies the uh, death penalty? the revival of the death penalty. First, uh, Senator Pacquiao does not consider himself a Catholic anymore because he has joined a Christian fellowship. That's my first premise. So as a Catholic bishop, out of respect for him, I say I respect his opinion as coming from a different church because I cannot judge him using Catholic standards because he is no longer a Catholic lay person. So I'll just uh, explain the Catholic position. The Lord Jesus Christ died because of death penalty. He was crucified. Jose Rizal died because of death penalty. Andres Bonifacio died because of death penalty. And all three people died innocent. Jesus Christ is sinless, Jose Rizal is now a hero, and Andres Bonifacio is now a hero. And there are so many other people who have been killed by death penalty who are innocent. As to the, uh, as to the comment, the opinion, that uh, the death penalty has biblical foundations, we in the Catholic Church say it is the exact opposite. Because... When Jesus Christ died on the cross, voluntarily accepting death, he accepted death so that there may, be, there may be no more deaths like that. He made this death as the last one so that there will be no more, no more deaths from injustice, from oppression after, after that. That was the intention. And yet, and yet, the dyings, the killings continue. It is not because the crucifixion was impotent. It is because we have not taken the lessons of Jesus Christ to heart. Thank you. Uh, the next questions in order are from TJ Burgonio. And then we will call uh, uh, Ador uh, Mayol in uh, Cebu City. And then after that, Christine Sabili of Inquire.net. TJ? Hi, Archbishop. Um, good afternoon. Welcome back. Uh, Archbishop, weeks ago, a uh, mass was held for the EJK victims in uh, Malabon. And one of the mothers said that, uh, where's the cardinal? Um, at other times, there was also a comment from um, some clergy uh, saying that, uh, we need someone like Cardinal Saint to speak out against EJKs. Um, is it fair to say that uh, the church has been silent on EJKs? Of course, not you have spoken individually, but um, apparently people are, are looking for uh, a stronger or even a more consistent statement from the, from the church. The pastoral letter that was read uh, on a Sunday in all the dioceses nationwide is the strong statement that we want to say to the Catholic faithful and even to those who do not belong to the Catholic Church. So 
we issue such a statement because the bishops, uh, 89 active bishops, were in session during the 114th Plenary Assembly. But before that, there have been statements from various bishops nationwide. Uh, we in Pangasinan had a mass for the souls of those who have been killed as early as September 14 last year. And uh, the other bishops have been asking for prayers and have been uh, lending support to the families of the victims of the so-called extrajudicial killings. So uh, I'm not defending my brother bishops, but what I'm saying is we have not been quiet. Unfortunately, fortunately for us or unfortunately for some people, uh, it is not covered by media, it is not covered by social media, but we have been doing our work on the ground. And uh, for example, in Pangasinan where I come from, I go to the wakes without any media, without any Twitter, without any announcement, and then condole and listen to the families of the victims. That's our reaching out. So, because before we make a statement against the killings, we must not forget that there are grieving people, there are grieving families. So after the killings, my immediate concern was to condole, to reach out, to give them hope, and to give them some consolation in their moment of grief. That's the immediate need. Because we might get lost in the statistics and forget that the families have faces. The, those killed have faces. We might forget they're not just statistics. And let us not just make a protest against the killings using 7,000 as our base. Each killing makes uh, a family an orphan. Each killing causes great sadness to the family. Each killing can cause even an attitude of revenge among the children who are left behind. So we are attending to all of these on a personal basis. So uh, with regards to your question about the mass for uh, the extrajudicial killing victims in Malabon, Malabon is actually the Diocese of Caloocan. And uh, it, they have a separate bishop. You know, Archbishop of Manila is Archbishop of Manila. It just happens that he is at the capital of the Philippines. But uh, the Archbishop of Manila is responsible for those under his care in the same way that the Archbishop of Cebu or Zamboanga or Cáceres or Tugigarao is responsible for those under his care. So let's not, let's not uh, just focus on one bishop or one archbishop or one cardinal. Rather, the question to ask is, what are we doing as Filipinos? Because if we throw the solution to the extrajudicial killings on one person or on a group of persons or on one institution, it is bound to fail because it will take 100 million Filipinos coming together with a family of nations in order to solve this problem. Uh, thank you, Father Song. In fact, I have some follow-up questions, but uh, we're going to take a call from uh, Ador Mayol, senior reporter of Cebu Daily News in Cebu City. Go ahead, Ador. Hello, good afternoon, Paul. Good afternoon. I have two related questions. First, uh, with only five years before the big event in 2021, the this centenary of the Philippines, uh, we would just want to know if, uh, what has been the preparations of CDCP for the big event and if there's a possibility of hope that is coming back for Madrid for the celebration. And second, how have the recent issues, particularly the kinder, the result of the government's war on drugs and plans to revive the death penalty, affect the preparations for, for that 2021 event? Especially that other countries to come to the Philippines where the seeds of capitalism in the far east were sown. That's all I'm okay. Thank you, Ador. Actually, we started the preparations for 2021 four years ago. So it's actually a nine year preparation which is in the Catholic Church like a novena 
not of days, but of years. So each year is uh, assigned one theme in preparation for the year 2021. The year 2021 will celebrate the first baptism and then the first Eucharist celebrated on Philippine soil. Will the Pope come for 2021? We brought it up to Pope Francis when he wanted to visit us uh, after the Yolanda typhoon. And uh, we told him, but uh, can you assure us that uh, you will visit us for our 500th anniversary? And he said, I think that will be done by the next Pope. So uh, he says, well, he is, he's very practical, he's very candid about it. About the death penalty and all the other issues that are pending in, uh, in Congress, it will certainly affect. And uh, from my heart, I will say, it would be a great shame that as we celebrate 500 years of Catholic faith in the Philippines, in the nine year preparation for it, the death penalty will be restored. It is going to cause us great shame as a nation because it is certainly contrary to the Catholic faith that we have received. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Christine Sabilio, Inquire.net. Archbishop, what can you say about President Duterte's comments that the church does not have moral ascendancy? In his speeches, he always mentions his alleged um, experience with the priest molesting him. Uh, what can the Catholic Church say about that? You know, since Jesus Christ founded the Catholic Church, until now, we churchmen have really been uh, imperfect. We are struggling, we fall, and we rise up. So the Catholic Church stands even after 2,000 years of the sinfulness of its men and women because the Catholic Church does not depend on the holiness of the men and women who lead it. The Catholic Church depends on the holiness of God. And therefore, the, the moral ascendancy of the church does not even come from its leaders. The moral ascendancy of the church comes from God himself who has chosen weak leaders to become his spokespersons in a world that needs the gospel. So there is no pretense. If you are telling us that uh, we are a bunch of sinners, we are, we are a bunch of hypocrites, we are a bunch of shameless uh, followers of Jesus Christ. The answer is yes. And we are struggling to rise up from our weakness. And the church has enough structures, it has enough systems, enough laws to put discipline among those who are uh, misbehaving, among those who whose lives are contrary to the mandate of the Lord Jesus. But beyond the sins of the church, there is holiness. And the holiness of the church, as I said, does not come from its men and women. Because the, whole, the church is holy because it is from Jesus Christ. And the holiness of the church comes from God himself. Because if this were only a human institution, with the sins of its men and women, the church would have collapsed long time ago. If the church is still standing after 2,000 years, it can only be supernatural. It cannot be natural. Um, Archbishop Sok, uh, the next three questions uh, will come from um, our opinion editor, Chato Garciliano, and then followed by uh, Belia Cariaso of uh, Inquire Bandera, and then after that, PDI reporter Julie Aurelio. But let me ask first a couple of uh, quick follow-up questions about Pacquiao and his Protestant view. But isn't it also true that there are, in, in fact, many Protestant churches who are against the, uh, the extrajudicial killings and have issued statements uh, saying it doesn't meet uh, their understanding of, uh, of the Bible? I think it is not for me to rebuke Senator Pacquiao. Maybe the one to rebuke him and to disprove his uh, 
uh, use of the Bible to prove the death penalty should be his own pastor. Out of respect for the church and out of respect for his uh, religious convictions. So uh, maybe his own pastor who guides him in, ter in interpreting the scriptures should be the best person to correct him, to rebuke him in case he has misinterpreted the word of God. Okay, thank you. We are not going to have that uh, uh, battle royale <laughs> between Archbishop Sok and uh, Pastor Manny Pacquiao. It's really, really just out of respect mm -hmm. for the differences in faith and out of respect for his position as a senator. And then my second follow-up, uh, Archbishop Sok, you mentioned that the pastoral letter uh, read the other weekend is the strong statement that people have been looking for. Why did it take you seven months? Was it because that was the first time you met in January as a group, or was there something else? Yes, we only meet twice a year, and we meet in July, and the, the next meeting is January. When we met in July, it was already brought up, but uh, the bishops also expressed uh, their opinion, or pastoral opinion, that maybe we should listen to the sentiments of the people, because 16 million of our countrymen, most of them Catholic faithful, have expressed support. So let us wait and see and uh, establish communication lines and see what we can do to, to help and support. It was still the critical collaboration, the vigilant collaboration that we have been espousing all these years. But between the July meeting and the January meeting, the, the rise in the killings have been so alarming. And uh, that is why it was actually first in our agenda in the January meeting. Thank you. PDI Opinion Editor, Chato Garciliano. Hi, Archbishop. Um, uh, as you have pointed out, uh, individual uh, clergymen have uh, spoken about the EJ case and everything else. And your pastoral letter was the strong statement that the church has declared. Malacanang has been uh, less than hospitable to your calls for uh, for um, for a stop to this EJ case. What do you think will be your next step? As a, having having uh, issued your pastoral statement, are you thinking of a dialogue with the president, or are you uh, just going to wait uh, for a whatever? Uh, process that Malacanang will propose. I hope you take a second reading of the pastoral letter, and you will notice that we did not make any reference to Malacanang. We did not make any reference to the president, because we wanted to treat the issue of killings as killings as a moral issue. Second, I was half expecting that Malacanang and the other sectors of society, businessmen, uh, teachers, uh, investors, and uh, media people would look at it as our contribution to a perceived social problem in the Philippines. Unfortunately, it was not taken in that, uh, in that context. It, 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 was, it was taken negatively. But it was certainly not our intention to bring down the president or bring down Malacanang. It was our contribution. We were saying, we, are, we your bishops, see the situation as like this. And if you share our conviction, these are the things that we must do together. So if you ask me about the reaction, I was hoping for a more open, a more, uh, how do you put it, uh, a position that, that would say, let's dialogue. Because uh, in this day and age, there is nothing that we cannot do if we dialogue together, if we work together. So I was hoping for that. Follow up. Follow up though. Just a follow up, Archbishop. Uh, since there is no, uh, no response to that effect yet, and as you said, you have not, and in fact, you stated there that you have not referred to Malacanang directly. Obviously, the, the, the soft sell approach is not working. That's my opinion. But uh, if, 
for after a certain period, there is no there is no response at all to your statement. And in fact, even if there is a proposed stop to the war on drugs, killings are still going on every night. What is your next step as a church? Thank you, the sir. The pastoral letter is addressed to the government. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. It is addressed to the people of God. So if the government does not act on it, we are hoping that the people of God would act on it, businessmen would act on it, teachers would act on it, media people would act on it, and hopefully, if the many sectors of society act together against the killings, maybe the government, being a listening government, would listen to the direction that the people has taken and join the other sectors of society. So I say it again, the letter is addressed to the people of God. So even if the government does not act on it, we are hoping that the other members of the people of God would act on it positively. Thank you. The next question is from Belia, who Good is uh, live streaming this as she yes. speaks. <laughs> Archbishop, yung follow-up ko lang po dun sa mga pag-atake ni President Duterte. In, mention, in attacking you, he even presented the altars of, altar of secrets, allegedly involving the corruption, the sexual abuses, and um, other corrupt, uh, anomalies uh, involving priests and bishops. Sir, aren't you worried that the fate of the Catholics will be affected in this continuous uh, uh, criticisms by the president, considering that there are a lot of support in our Many angles. Una, kung titing, kung tatanungin niyo, does it affect us? Does it affect me? Ako, with all candor and with all honesty, I will say, it does not. Kasi, alam ko in my heart of hearts, na hindi naman tao ang huhusga sa akin eh. Sa huling hining ako, hindi naman palakpak ng tao yung hahanapin ko eh. It is not survey, it is not popularity. Kung anong sinasabi ng Diyos tungkol kay Sok, yun ang mahalaga sa akin. At sa tingin ko naman sa pagdadasal ko araw-araw, ay hindi naman yun ang sinasabi ng Diyos tungkol sa akin. Kaya at peace ako. Pero pangalawa, Sabi mo, baka naman ma-mislead yung mga maliliit. Baka maniwala sila. Doon papasok yung element ko bilang simbahan, bilang taong simbahan, na naniniwala ako na may Diyos pa rin na hindi pababayaan na manaig yung kadiliman, manaig yung kamalian, manaig yung kasinungalingan. Kasi mayroon naman talagang marumi sa simbahan. Pero kapag in-expose mo yung marumi, kailangan meron ding kasamang challenge to be better. Kapag sinabi mo dun sa katabi mo, uh, hindi maganda yung damit mo, pero ang resulta noon ay na-discourage na, na wala na yung self-esteem, hindi maganda yon. Pero kung sinabi mo sa katabi mo, hindi maganda yung damit mo, at ito yung suggestion ko sa'yo para gumanda yung appeal mo, you give that person hope. So yun ang pakiusap ko, na sana kung magkocorrect tayo, bibigyan natin ng bawat isa ng pag-asa. Hindi yung sugatan na, marumi na, sisipain pa natin. Kasi hindi yun makatao. Pangatlo, na sinasabi mo, ano yung dapat naming gawin? Alam mo, hindi naman kasi likas sa simbahan na lumaban eh. So, likas sa simbahan na magpahayag ng totoo at likas din sa simbahan na yung nagpahayag ng totoo ay humandang mahirapan. So, kasama na yun. So, if you proclaim the truth, those who are against the truth will fight back. If you proclaim God, the enemies of God will fight back. But you must not withdraw from a good fight. You must keep on proclaiming God because... In the end, in the end, it is only God who can give us that happiness, that peace that we are looking for. So, at peace ba ako? At peace. Galit ba ako? Hindi ako galit. 
Maniwala ka sa akin. At hindi rin ako lalaban. Hindi rin ako lalaban. Sapagkat mayroong sariling panlaban yung katotohanan eh. At yung buhay na mga nagsisikap na maglingkod sa ibang tao. That itself is the proof that there is still goodness in the church and there is still goodness in this country. Thank you. Julie Aurelia. Good afternoon po, Archbishop. Um, related po sa question ni Ma'am Bella. Uh, are you not worried that the church is, ruling, uh, is losing its relevance given na sa social media, uh, maraming hindi agree sa mga opinion nyo about reproductive health, death penalty, EJ case. Are you not worried that you're, you're losing relevance and you're losing your connect with your flock? Hindi worry ang salita siguro. I think yung bashing, yung opposition, should be a point for the church's self-examination so that the gospel can be proclaimed in the terminology, in the methodology of our youth, of our children, of, of this generation. Worry, hindi worry. I think it is challenging. It is challenging us to express the gospel no longer in the, in the formula dogmas and doctrines of before, but in the language of men and women of our time. Uh, worry, as I said, there is no reason to worry. The, that worry should be translated into opening up, being challenged, so that we can see the beauty of those who are bashing us. We can see the beauty of those who consider us their enemies. Tingnan, hanapin yung goodness. Kasi lahat ng tao may goodness. Kahit yung bashers, kahit yung sabi nila ay kaaway ng simbahan, yung mga nagdi-disagree sa RH o nagdi-disagree sa position ng against the death penalty, meron silang sinasabi. So ang kailangan ng simbahan ay makinig ng extra. Makinig ng extra. Kapag nakinig tayo ng extra at binigyan natin ng, ng pagkakataon na magsalita, baka magkaroon tayo ng pagkakataon na mabuksan din sila makapasok sila sa atin at makapasok din tayo sa kanila. Hindi nakakawari yun. Challenging. And after challenging is listening. And after listening, we can reach a common ground. Thank you. Uh, the next three questions uh, will be uh, PDI Senior Reporter Nico Dizon and then Columnist uh, Ceres Doyo and then... Uh, um, uh, research um, head, uh, minor Henerelao. But just allow me to ask a follow-up question. Uh, earlier, uh, Chato Garciliano talked to you about the possibility of dialogue. Um, I had a chance to interview uh, Economic Planning Secretary Ernie Pernia, and he said there are actually three ex-seminarians uh, in the cabinet, uh, Ernie, uh, June Vasco, and I think the in, uh, Interior Secretary. And he said that they had actually talked among themselves and said, you know, they can, they can actually serve as a bridge. If the cabinet, the rest of the cabinet and the CBCP would be interested in, a, you know, in, in, in a meeting or a, or, a, or a dialogue, would, how would you respond to that? Yes, I am not at liberty to divulge names, but uh, in the plenary assembly, we also designated a good number of bishops to keep the communication lines open with the government. And they're doing that pretty well. Okay, thank you. Nico? Good afternoon, Archbishop. My question is a follow-up also to Ma'am Chato's question. Why is it that the church, you know, seemingly to us, is quite hesitant to be to lead um, your flock, the people now, in this, um, you know, the issue against um, extrajudicial killings? And mainly how the president, his unorthodox way of leadership, because we know that in our recent history, um, the church did lead uh, the Filipinos when there was this uh, moral and social issues um, that hounded us? Uh, the church's response, even during the martial years, those among us who are old enough to remember, 
you would you would also remember that the church was listening not just to the victims of the martial law years, but also keeping communication lines open with the government. That is how the word critical collaboration came about. And it is still critical collaboration. There is a certain degree of openness to the needs of the people, especially the voiceless, especially those who are living in terror, especially those who are living in sin. But at the same time, there is a level of openness also with the government because the government is still composed of Filipinos and most of them Catholics, as has been said, three of them ex-seminarians, and they are also in need of our pastoral care. So uh, to say that the church is not involved or, or hesitant is uh, probably a judgment, okay? But from our point of view, we look at it from the bigger perspective, from the bigger point of view, and looking at the uh, pro and anti as both our parishioners. So we want to keep the communication lines open to all sectors of society because we are bishops. Uh, in the years of uh, martial law, yes, the church was quite vocal and quite active, but uh, you must also remember that there were also occasions in those years when Cardinal Sin found himself inside Malacanang saying Mass for President Marcos or attending socials in Malacanang. It was, it was a tightrope, walking on a tightrope, striking a balance between uh, being a prophet of denunciation and yet a minister of healing and reconciliation. And until now, that is clearly our mission. We will denounce what is evil, but we will also offer the ministry of healing to those who are willing and ready to receive it. Thank you. Um, Ceres? Good afternoon, Bishop. Uh, well, President Duterte is big on death for drug traffickers, pushers, addicts. He's also supposed to be big on rehabilitation as shown by the big rehab center in Nueva Ecija that he, he boasts of. Does the church have a similar rehab program or something parallel to it? I know that uh, the bishops and other religious groups have ministries for OFWs, women, health, even prisons, but nothing very specific on drugs. Is the church planning something along this line? And is the church equipped uh, as far as personnel, finances, etc., are concerned? Thank you. There is a whole farm in uh, Masbate that is fully dedicated to the rehab of uh, former drug users. Pachenda Esperanza. It is in Masbate. And it is not, in a manner of speaking, a drug rehab center because it has no walls. And uh, what it does is establish a relationship of trust with one another, bring back self-esteem, bring back the feeling of belonging to a family, equip them with jobs because with job comes dignity. And when that is done, as a matter of course, they start also to lay drugs aside. The cravings are also diminished because dignity, uh, self-esteem is restored. We still have other dioceses uh, doing drug rehab programs, as has been uh, stated in the social media. The, uh, the Bulacan uh, Drug Rehab Center is 27 years old and relying purely on donations. And we have many other NGOs, not necessarily run by priests and bishops, but run by Catholic lay faithful who attend to that. So when you speak of church-sponsored drug rehab programs, do not just focus on boards 
uh, board members with priests and bishops in there. Because the church is, is lay, religious, and, and bishops and priests together. So we have so many NGOs run by Catholic faithful, motivated by Catholic teaching, who operate such rehabs. But related to that uh, question, if you ask the ordinary Filipino, and we are in touch with our grassroots, they will tell you that the biggest problem of the Philippines is still poverty. So our opinion is, if you look at the drug problem as a problem all by itself, we might not be able to solve it. Because for all you know, the drug problem is only a, a symptom of a deeper problem. And the deeper problem is poverty. The deeper problem is there are no services available to the poor. And uh, the problem of poverty is not just a problem of resources. The problem of poverty is not just a problem of population or of consumers. The problem of poverty is really a problem of values because we start to live only for ourselves, walang pakialam sa ibang tao, that is where it all begins. In every person who starts to get interested in, the, in drugs, there is that longing to belong. There is that longing for peace that I cannot find. There is that longing for, for friends. And because of that longing, they fall into the attraction of drugs. And drug pushers, who would want to be a drug pusher? If there is an alternative, which is a dignified job, which is uh, hanap buhay na pinaghirapan. You can ask any drug pusher and they're going to tell you dahil sa kahirapan. So kung meron lang kaming pwedeng paghanap buhayan, siguradong sigurado, hindi kami magpupush, hindi kami magtutulak ng droga sapagkat alam namin masama yun. So, sana tingnan natin yung problema na poverty. At sana tingnan natin na kung masosolve natin yung poverty sa pamamagitan ng Pagbibigay ng kapangyarihan sa mga may hirap, pagbibigay ng trabaho, at pag-improve ng ating educational system, ng ating value system, baka hindi natin kailangang isolve ng hawak-hawak sa, in a manner of speaking, holding by the horns the problem of drug abuse. Maybe the problem of drug abuse will be solved as they have seen in Facenda Esperanza not by depriving them of drugs, but by giving them alternatives. And the alternative is a life of dignity, a life of love, and a life of, compa uh, a life of, of charity for one another, where people can trust one another. You know, there is, the, there, is the poverty, there is the poverty of hunger, there is the poverty of... Uh, of uh, lack of food, lack of shelter, lack of uh, uh, social services. But there is also the poverty of affluence. People are rich and they are lonely. So how do you solve that? People think they can use drugs. People think they can get richer by selling drugs. So we offer an alternative. We are not saying that the drug problem is not serious. It is serious and it must be solved. But killing will not solve it because it will just create a culture of revenge. It will just create a culture of disregard for the rights of human beings. You know, to use drugs is against the commandment, thou shalt not kill. You cannot solve the problem of drugs which kills people by killing people who kill people. You we must be able to offer an alternative. And as I said, the problem is still, first and foremost, poverty. Thank you. The next question is from our research head, who is our resident uh, biblical scholar. <laughs> she will ask her question in Hebrew. Magadang hapon, Father Sok. I was told not to ask the question in Hebrew. 
yung in the pastoral letter there's there's the quote on the book from the book of Ezekiel it says for i find no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies how is that in hebrew <laughs> in um the book of Ezekiel was written in a very sad and hard times. It was when uh, the people of God were in exile. And then I remember, what I remember most about the book was the metaphor of the valley of the dead bones. Do you consider ourselves to be in the time when we are in our valley of dead bones? And, but that metaphor also uh, uh, was also used by prophet, the prophet Ezekiel to bring hope to the people. Uh, so, the two first two questions is, are we now in a valley of dead bones? And in the end, after all that is happening now, are you hopeful for the future? I will offer another metaphor. <laughs> and it is not from the Old Testament. It is from the New Testament. I would say, we are not in the valley of dead bones. We are on the sidewalk on the way of the cross. And uh, this way of the cross has so many consolations. You have the women of Jerusalem, you have the Virgin Mother, you have Veronica, you have Simon of Cyrene, consoling the Lord on the way of the cross. It is not a valley of dead bones. It is a road on the way to Calvary. And uh, we may be feeling crucified, we may be feeling unjustly treated, but there is a lot of consolation every step along the way. And even if this way of the cross leads us to Mount Calvary, we must not forget that the story does not end in Calvary. The story ends with an empty tomb. And the tomb is empty up until now. The goodness of the Filipino shines best in the garden of affliction along the way of the cross. And it blooms best in the mountain, not of Baguio, which is cool and comfortable, but in the mountain of Calvary which is sanctified by the blood of the Lord. So, are you asking me, am I full of hope? My answer is, is there any other way but to hope? Because hope alone is the solution to all our problems. When our nation loses hope, then we really have a very, very serious problem. So, we're not in the valley of death. We are on the way to Calvary, but every step along the way, God offers us surprises of consolations. So do not be afraid. My isang follow-up question lang, because we mentioned about hope and something being lost. Uh, in your opinion, Father, have we lost the magic of EDSA? Have we lost the magic of EDSA? Well, EDSA has no magic. <laughs> Because EDSA was not a magic. It was not just four days of courage in 1986. EDSA, EDSA began in 1521 when Christianity first came to the Philippines. So EDSA was, less, was like a momentary break, a momentary uh, stop in the pilgrimage of Filipinos as a Christian nation. So, EDSA has no magic because the enchantment that is perceived to be called EDSA 1986 only comes from millions and millions of Filipinos who have lived the Catholic faith. Maybe they lived and died without even imagining the glorious days of EDSA. But when EDSA was taking place, we were standing on the shoulders of millions and millions of Christians who have built up 
a civilization of Christianity for the Philippines. Okay, wow. Uh, the the uh, next question is two questions from social media, uh, care of uh, J.V. Rufino, our director for mobile, and then a question from Alvin Barcelona uh, of uh, Radio Inquirer. Okay, uh, we have two questions here from, uh, from uh, Facebook, Twitter, Viber, and our other platforms. First question, uh, is it true that the church has shareholdings in certain mining companies? And I guess, what is the stand of the church in general vis-a-vis -vis mining? That's one. Okay, let's, the, let's stop there first. Start. I speak for the Archdiocese of Lingay and the Gupan. We have none. Okay. I speak also for the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines. We have none. Uh, there was really a time, a few years, many years ago, when, we, when some dioceses had shares in mining companies. But uh, with the understanding, the bigger, the better understanding of the harm that mining does, we have also made a collective decision to let go of such shares because we are not supposed to make any revenue for the benefit of the poor coming from the destruction, coming from corporations that cause the destruction of nature. Okay. But Archbishop, the church also is open to responsible mining, right? Yes, because our chalices <laughs> are also from mines. They are, they are metal. And uh, our, our spoons and our forks are from mining. So there is, there is such a thing as responsible mining. What it means is we must use the resources of the earth according to the design that God had for it. That is responsible mining. In other words, when mining is conducted, separated from God, it becomes harmful for humanity. Responsible mining actually means mining according to the design that God has for us. Thank you. JV? Second question, um, on another matter altogether. What is the best solution to the exploding number of HIV cases in the Philippines? Education. As I said, similar to poverty, poverty is not just a problem of resources and consumers. Poverty boils down to a decay in humanism, in a culture of sharing, living for others. And so it is with HIV. We can attempt to solve HIV uh, with solutions like condom distribution, with solutions like so-called safe sex. But the HIV spread is more a crisis of values more than a, a spread of virus. Because when values are eroded and the, the human person is, is regarded as a thing from whom you can derive pleasure, whom you can use, whom you can pay, then you have a problem. But of course, HIV is not just limited to sexual misconduct. You can also get HIV uh, from other sources, like, like needles. And sometimes people get infected with HIV without even engaging in something that is sinful. So how do you handle a situation like that? It's still, more Im most importantly, values formation. A return to humanism, a return to ethics, a return to God. Actually, you can put it a return to your real self because that real self has been covered by so many attractions, so many, uh, so many distractions, and so many fleeting lights that uh, actually divert our attention from the essentials. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is uh, Alvin Barcelona. Raja Inquirer. Uh, Dr. Nupo Bishop. Uh, you said earlier that the so far the strongest message for the people uh, is the pastoral letter. And um, are we expecting more pastoral letters or maybe something else from the church uh, to get to the point that the people listen and move 
from, uh, in my opinion, a state of apathy? I think the pastoral letter should not be regarded as a, an expression of a strong statement because the strong statement is concerted, unified action from God-loving people. That is the better statement. We say actions speak louder than words, and actions of charity and compassion actually speak louder than pastoral letters. So what we need are not more pastoral letters. What we need is probably more like Mother Teresa of Calcutta walking the streets of the Philippines, attending to the needs of those who are suffering. So don't focus too much on the strength or the strong words that pastoral letters may contain. Because after a while, they are bound to be forgotten. But actions of compassion, actions on behalf of justice, actions of truth are longer lasting. And that's the bigger statement. Thank you. The next question is uh, from Nico Dizon. Um, Archbishop, I have two questions on the death penalty bill. So right now, um, the House of Representatives, they're having the plenary debates on the death penalty, penalty bill. And the speaker himself says that they, they, will, they are bent on passing it. So what is the church now doing? Um, are, are you stepping up your lobby? Are you um, coordinating with more anti-death penalty advocates to make sure that your voices are heard and at least to and maybe try not to have the bill passed and second um this morning the speaker also challenged the church na every time though kasi it's being said that the death penalty is anti-poor because the poor cannot hire good lawyers to defend themselves um why doesn't the catholic church pour in their resources to um for the legal you know for legal aid for the poor First is, uh, I have said this before, the church leaders are not social troublemakers. And the church leaders are not Congress lobbyists. That is not our duty. Our duty is to disturb consciences, to teach consciences, so that based on that educated, well-formed, Christ-like conscience, then laws can be passed. So my appeal is still for conscience. At the end of the day, I hope the speaker will allow a conscience vote on the death penalty. And I know that if conscience will be allowed to prevail over party lines, we would, it would be a, sh a moment of glory for our legislators because it is the triumph of conscience over party lines. Second, we are against criminality. We want a peaceful world and we want a peaceful country. What we offer instead of the death penalty is a an aggressive reform of the justice system, of the judicial system. Because if the judicial system will be reformed, meaning to say the police, the prosecution, the judge, the, uh, the belibid, the jail, and penology, if there's going to be a reform among the pillars of the justice system, we would be able to restore peace, bring down criminality, because that is a sure deterrent to crime. So we are not just protesting against the death penalty. We are offering an alternative. Reform the justice system. Reform the PNP. Reform the Department of Justice and our, judi our judiciary. Reform the, the jail and penology. With all of these reforms, I think we would be on the right track without having to kill criminals by mistake. 
because who are we to make a decision on the guilt or the innocence of another person? Kung nagkamali ka ng decision at patay na yon, ano sabihin mo? Wow, mali, sorry. We cannot do that because this person is dead. And uh, you cannot restore that anymore. So, with the, with the question about uh, the church helping in the, in the, with the poor, yes, we are already doing that. And we promise you, we will increase our presence with the poor, especially with providing legal system. It is not, we are not starting something new. We have been doing that all these years. Thank you. Lito. Our uh, Vatican correspondent. <laughs> Monsignor Lito. <laughs> Lito Zulueta. Your Excellency. <laughs> so, a strong pastoral statement is not the end all and be all, but concerted action of the faithful of the Filipinos. So you've called for a March for Life this Saturday. What, what issues will be addressed by this uh, rally? And what do you hope to achieve by this? It's called Walk for Life, and it would be on February 18, from 4.30 in the morning until around 7 in the morning, gathering at Quirino Grandstand and uh, walking towards the Rizal Monument Ross Boulevard and back by Manila Hotel Road and back to the Grandstand. That's as simple as it is. There will be no mass. People will just pray and fill the streets with prayers. As I said in my appeal, the streets should be kept safe and the streets should be filled with prayers, not with blood. And the place, the place for uh, safety should be everywhere in the Philippines. We should feel safe going around the country. That is the message that we just want to deliver. And after that, we hope that there will be more people who would be disturbed every time one human person is killed. Because one brother or sister killed is already too much. And we should not allow this to keep on increasing. So it is just one of the many. But uh, please uh, correct the misimpression. The CBCP did not start it. I only gave an endorsement. This was started by lay leaders, the laico uh, from, from uh, the various dioceses and archdioceses all over the Philippines. And uh, such should be the case. After, after the pastoral letter, they said, we want to do this, and here are the bishops supporting you. So such lay initiatives are greatly encouraged. So in fairness to the LICO, it is not a CBCP uh, initiative. It is a lay initiative supported by the bishops. Um, Archbishop, you've known uh, Cardinal Sin uh, like a son knows his father. Uh, do you think Cardinal Sin spoiled us? I mean... Some of the assumptions behind our questions posit the presence of a cardinal sin, a larger-than-life figure, you know, charismatic, can walk that fine line, the tightrope, uh, and still uh, be credible when he talks about critical collaboration. And of course, at that time, was head of a much larger archdiocese. Now it's been broken into six. So I don't know if I'm being facetious with that question, but. It seems like we're looking for another cardinal sin. And we should not look for another cardinal sin because he died already. <laughs> and let's give him rest. Uh, second is the situation in the 1970s until the 1990s when Cardinal Sin was Archbishop of Manila is quite different from how it is now. Cardinal Sin never saw Facebook. And we have social media. Cardinal Sin never imagined inquirer multimedia like this. So times have changed. So Cardinal Sin, in a matter of speaking, and pardon me for my bias, was God's gift to the Filipino people at that point in our history. 
And I think if you look for cardinal sin in 2017, it would be unfair to cardinal sin, it would be unfair to God, it would be unfair to the, to the, to the leaders that God has sent to his people because the situation is different and God sends leaders to his people according to the needs of the people at that particular time. Okay. Um, Chito, uh, yes. uh, we have a question from uh, Chito De La Vega, Editor-in-Chief of Inquire Libre. The, uh, good, good afternoon, Father. Uh, the Speaker of the House has really gone all out gung-ho in campaigning for the passing of the uh, death penalty. Uh, are we, is, is the church going as far as going to uh, deprive Holy Communion to uh, those who are really out and out for the death penalty bill. I mean, there, there have been, ano na, talaga magsasalita po sila. You know, this seat is already hot. Why are you making it hotter? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, uh, it's, it, it, the matter of depriving somebody of Holy Communion has a long process behind it. We cannot, we cannot declare it like that. We cannot even make a generic statement like that. I don't think it can be done. I don't think it should be said. Because to declare somebody as uh, undeserving of Holy Communion takes a lot of due process on the part of the church. Um, maybe just, uh, we're running long and it's, it's good. Uh, maybe just a few more questions, uh, Archbishop Sok. Um, how did the pastoral statement, which many people were waiting for, come about? Um, what, what, was, what is the process that the CBCP follows in coming out with a statement like that? I mean, do you, do you have one writer who starts it and then there's a committee or whatever, or do you? So it is put on the agenda that we will discuss a possible pastoral letter on the killings. And then we invited some resource persons, uh, church people, non-church people, professionals, experts, to give us uh, advice. After that, the bishops give inputs what, about what the contents of the pastoral letter should be. And the secretariat puts that together in summary form. And after that is put in summary form a committee of maximum of three bishops, minimum of two, is, up, is designated to put in style the uh, summary made by the secretariat. And uh, they're not supposed to sleep <laughs> because the following day, that is first in the agenda, and they're supposed to present the first draft. When the first draft is presented, it is presented on the screen, and all the bishops critic it, and then after the second critiquing, it is thrown back to the secretariat and the styling committee for the final form. And then it is returned to us in the afternoon or maybe late in the afternoon. And then it is presented to the body for final voting. So if you ask uh, me who are the drafters, the, or the original would be the bishops themselves. And then it is put in style and in summary form and then uh, critiqued again, revised again, and then presented for approval. And then the final version, uh, Archbishop, uh, do you like burn ballots or? No, we, <laughs> just, <laughs> do you we just raise hands. <laughs> and generally there is always a consensus. If almost, almost unanimous when a pastoral letter is passed. Um, any other questions? Um, um, Monsignor TJ Bergogno. Hi, Monsignor. Just uh, to go back to the critical collaboration you said earlier, how do we go about it, uh, given what Nico said, uh, what she described as the president's unorthodox style? Uh, to what extent are we going to do to handle this or to do this critical collaboration? Number one, we have to look at the good things that the party is doing. We have to look at the good things. 
for example, uh, the good things being done for the poor, the good things being done to combat corruption, the good things being done in terms of uh, uh, look, uh, reaching out to the margins, to the periphery. We should look for the positive things that the other party across the table is doing and uh, highlight them. In our Christian tradition, St. Paul says, you overcome evil by the power of good. So you increase the influence of goodness by highlighting them. Second is there must be an understanding of yourself, me as a church, that I am not part of government, that I should respect my own identity as a churchman, and the government, please respect its identity as a servant of the people. That uh, we elect presidents, we elect mayors, we elect congressmen, we elect uh, legislators, we don't elect God. So there must be an understanding of who you are and who the other party is. Third is there will be many occasions when we will not be able to agree. But let us look always for the middle ground. So the request is we are willing to cooperate for the good of the people. And we have been doing that we have been doing that all these years, all these centuries in the Philippines. Hospitals, schools, orphanages, even drug rehabs recently. We have been doing our best. So what I'm saying is, I hope, I hope the other side just looks at the little, the little good things that we have also contributed to this country as we also recognize the many good things that they have done for the country and highlight those things and come to the middle ground and maybe explore possibilities of greater and greater and greater collaboration. Because we do not achieve anything by bringing down one another. Archbishop, what does Pope Francis know about the Philippine situation? Is he up to date? The, the course is through the Apostolic Noon Show. The Apostolic Nuncio is the representative of Pope Francis, or of the Pope, to any country. And uh, it is the Apostolic Nuncio that uh, transmits information to the Holy See, to, to Rome. And it is through the Apostolic Nuncio also that uh, instructions or opinions or directives coming from Rome are transmitted to the nation. Uh, would, would you say he is up to date? He knows what's happening? I have not seen him for quite some time, but I suppose so. Uh, during the papacy of Pope John Paul, I saw that personally, that Pope John Paul II was really so updated about the Philippines. And so it is with uh, Pope Benedict, because I had I had one-on-one -on -one meetings with him. So I suppose it is still the same with Pope Francis, that he's very much updated about what is going on in many other parts of the world. Okay, I think the next. Ah, okay, we have. I, I was about to ask for uh, confessions. <laughs> uh, uh, one, one more question from our um, opinion editor, Chato Garciliano. Archbishop, uh, in the event that the three ex seminarians in the cabinet uh, are able to uh, touch base with yourself and your uh, and the other archbishops. Uh, how will how will such a dialogue proceed? Uh, you will first, of course, have to lay down ground rules, granting that you have an agreement. And and, and, and just as a question, do you think it will be held in Malacanang or in or probably in a neutral ground? First, before you go into a meeting like that, yes, yes. you have to define the agenda uh -huh, uh -huh. and the parameters. Yes. It is only in Choir Multimedia that I didn't ask for any agenda. <laughs> so we have to ask for an agenda so that we can define and prepare. Yes, of course. Because if you go there unprepared, most likely the meeting will just be unproductive. Absolutely, yes. Because the process is even more important than the results. Absolutely. Second is, uh, I don't know, we can meet anywhere. 
We can meet anywhere that is conducive for dialogue. It can be a church. It can be, it can be anywhere. Uh, the, 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 because the venue is not important. What is important is the openness and the honesty of those who will sit down in dialogue. In short, and, you are open to such a thing. Oh, we have been always open. Okay. And as I told you, although I'm not at liberty to divulge, we have a, a group of bishops who have been designated to keep the, those communication lines open. And I have heard that uh, yeah, one of those three cabinet secretaries have established contacts with one of the bishops that we have uh, uh, designated. Thank you. Uh, w one more, uh, Archbishop. I hope you don't mind. Nico. Archbishop, um, is the church afraid of President Duterte? No. We are only afraid of sin. We are not even afraid of God. Because I know God loves me so much, I have no reason to be afraid of Him. The church as church is only afraid of sin. Because sin separates us from God. All the others are manageable. Do not be afraid of death, sickness, persecution, harm. Because the word of God is very clear. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So when I say we are not afraid of President Duterte, do not get me wrong. I am not playing, uh, I'm not picking a fight. I am not saying we are equals, no. What I'm saying is there is only one thing that makes us afraid, and that is sin. All the others, if God is with us, no one, nothing can ever be against us. Um, maybe one more, Archbishop. Um, I, I've had a chance to interview Edgar Matobato, the self-confessed uh, Davao Death Squad uh, member. I noticed that in his Senate testimony, he said that... Um, at certain points, he was helped by the church. Can you explain? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if you yourself are involved, but why is the church involved uh, with people like Edgar Matobato? Because it is the mission of the church. Somebody who says to you, my life is in danger, can you help me? He don't ask are you a criminal? Are you homosexual? Are you, are you non-Filipino? Are you Russian or what? No. This person's life is in danger. Your first duty is to help. And because of the Christian tradition of the Filipinos, that they trust the church and they know that the church has a tradition of giving safety to refugees, that is probably in his DNA. He's looking for safety. He went to the church and says, I'm in danger. Can you help me? That is not that is not extraordinary. That is, that is how it has always been. People whose lives are in danger, people needing help, people, people who are confused, people at the brink of suicide, they just go to the church and the church always welcomes. The church has a long tradition of taking care of refugees, of those who are confused, of those whose lives are in danger. And it is not an isolated case. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, Jocelyn Wood. Um, there will be a new CBC pre president in January. Po. Um, <coughs> by December 1st. Uh, by December. Do you think po, um, it will help improve the relationship between the church and the government if the next CBCB president will come from Davao? If the bishop, yeah, the bishop from Davao. What are you saying about me? <laughs> no, joking. Uh, it really depends on the bishops. So, like, I was not expecting to be elected in 2013. I didn't know why they put me there. I was unprepared. I did not know that they were murmuring behind my back, that they were planning to vote for me. I did not know that. I was really caught off guard. I didn't know. Really, I didn't know. But uh, if we tell our priests to obey the bishops, and then this X number of bishops say, you be president, how can I 
say no because I would lose my credibility when it comes to obedience. So the election is always a surprise. So anybody is eligible to be president of the CBCP. I mean, I mean, among the member, <laughs> among the member bishops, I mean, no, anybody can be elected except those who have been elected for two terms. Uh, Archbishop, you weren't executive vice president of uh, CBCP uh, in 2013. I was vice president of Archbishop Palma. But Archbishop Palma was still supposed to have a second term. A second term, I see. Okay, uh, Sarah, uh, please. Last question. What would be, if someone who was engaged in extrajudicial killing came up to you to confess, what would be your advice? My first concern is to put this person in the grace of God. First and foremost because I am a priest. So my first advice would be if, he, if the person is not yet ready for confession, I will introduce him to the love of God. I will introduce him to the seriousness of sin. I will introduce him to the mercy of the Lord. And I, I will introduce him to the harm that he has done to another fellow human being. And hopefully, Introducing him to such, conscience will be lightened, will be enlightened rather, and then he or she seeks pardon, and then I will lead him to confession. That is my primary purpose, and always my first step, to lead... No, no, no. Public confession. No, no, to, to be reconciled with God and to make a confession in the sacrament. In the sacrament, meaning to say, go to, if he does not like to confess to me, I will bring him to a priest who can hear his confession and liberate him from his sin and forgive his sins, her, her sins. And then, after that is done, then probably, as the situation necessitates, then we can move, if, if he so desires, to move into public confession to repair the damage that he has done. But there is no obligation whatsoever because if he chooses to remain anonymous, I will also die with that seal of uh, the sacrament. So I say my first step is to bring him to God and to bring him the grace of God. The second step is to let him receive the mercy of God in the sacrament of reconciliation. And once that is done, all the others will follow from there. So that, that uh, implies that with Matobato, coming out is part of that public confession? Part of uh, the restitution? I suppose. I, I don't know. Because uh, I am not in touch with him. So just, yes. just one quick follow-up to Ceres, Archbishop Salk. Uh, we have our Justice Secretary said that drug addicts and drug poachers are not human. Can you enlighten us on that? But who decides who is human? That's my first reaction. Second, if you say that the brain of this drug user is already rotten and dried, and therefore they will not be productive to society, my, th my second question is, what do you do with somebody who is lying there in the hospital in a state of semi-coma, not productive for society, not contributing to social growth, not earning any money, spending a lot of money because of the hospital bills? What do you do with that person? Does that person cease to be a human being because he is no longer productive for humanity. I don't think God died on the cross to just leave it, to just leave humanity like that. My third question is if you just judge the humanity of a person in terms of productivity for the world, for society, then what do you do with a newly born baby 
who cannot earn, who has to be bathed, who has to be fed, who is totally dependent on an adult. That is also a weak, in quotation marks, useless human being. Shall we say that baby is not a human being either? So the statement causes us to ask some more, what do you really mean? Because if the answer to the questions I posed is that person in semi-coma who is useless is no longer a human being, or the baby in the womb of the mother is a liability for the income of the family, and therefore is not a human being, then we have reason to really stand up for life and teach the dignity of human life over and over again until our voices get hoarse, we will not stop because this is not God's design for us. And I think on that note, we can end this uh, instructive, uh, uh, enlightening, uh, also very provocative uh, interview. Uh, we'd like to uh, bring this to a proper end by calling on the driving spirit of the inquirer and the uh, guarantor of our editorial independence, <laughs> the group CEO, Sandy Prieto Romaldes. Thank you, John. Um, thank you, our Archbishop Villegas, for shedding light on the many deep concerns and the views and opinion uh, of the church. Uh, thank you for taking all our questions, even if it uh, did, didn't have a prepared agenda, uh, and making uh, holy the hot seat. No? Um, answers that I would particularly remember are when you said, uh, to denounce evil, but you must work with reconciliation for those who want it. Um, also, in, in, in that, um, uh, when you came out with a pastoral letter, you were hoping for critical collaboration with, as you said, businessmen, teachers, and including media. No? So that, that's, that's a point that we will reflect on also in, in how to be able to contribute um, in what you're calling, uh, there must be concerned and collective action from that. No? Um, and that these, these actions must be based on compassion, justice, and faith. I think we don't need to go to church for the rest of the year after listening to your answers, Bishop, Archbishop. It was very, very uh, good. Um, I, I, I will take home also that there is goodness in our bashers and those who persecute us. Um, that to view this as a challenge, um, that the, the right thing to do and, and, and nothing will come out of us putting each other down, but actually, uh, again, working for collaboration. I will, all of us, I think, will hold on to your words in, in, in thinking that uh, there is hope, as uh, Minor had asked, uh, that we are in, as you had called, the sidewalk um, on the way to the cross uh, and the road on the way to Calvary. Hopefully it's not as long as uh, and as painful as, as that. No, but but when you said hope is part of the solution, I, and that we must have hope. Um, Archbishop, please accept our, our our simple token of appreciation. A book we published uh, to commemorate our 30th year um, last uh, two years uh, two Decembers ago. Um, it's it's about the Inquirer story. Um, May it continually include your disturbance and teaching of our conscience, which will all hope will lead to action. Thank you. Okay. Uh, at this point, we are going to call the uh, proceedings to an end. Uh, those of you watching on the different Inquirer platforms, thank you and good afternoon. <laughs>